Somebody's getting a drink. Yeah. Okay. And I think we have like 30 people online. Nice. Cool. Okay. Such a technology <laughs> joining online and, and in person. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, joining to our meetup. Not sure if this is your first time or you have been here before. How many of you first timers? Okay. Welcome. How many of you been here before? Yay. Okay. More first timers. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to this meetup. This is um, had actually real, uh, really uh, long change of names history. We just started this in 2013 as Microsoft BI meetup, then changed to Microsoft SQL Server and BI meetup, changed to Power BI meetup. These days we call it Power BI Analytics meetup. Um, it's a free event. We run it on a monthly basis, usually pre-COVID. It used to be in that room because this room was up here before. This is in the whole new room. Um, um, during the key, uh, COVID, we did it online. Now, this is the first hybrid meeting I think we are doing after a while. Um, who is running this? It's me, uh, David here, Indira. She's not here today. She's on a travel in India and Leila, who is helping on the uh, door to get people in. After 5.30, these doors are closed, so you have to call to uh, let you in here. Uh, the topics are usually around Power BI and Microsoft Data Analytics technologies. Um, feel free to join our meetup page. That is where we announce all the new coming meetups. Uh, now, today's speaker is Daryl from Insights, uh, and today's sponsor is also Insights. Uh, Richard helped a lot on drinks and food and catering, and of course, uh, Microsoft with this amazing menu. Uh, I'll just do a very quick in, in like a news of Power BI, recent news of Power BI, and then I'll hand it over to Daryl. Uh, so um, there has been some updates, not sure how many of you heard about this, but one of the problems with Power BI, my workspace previously was that if someone uses my workspace and upload a Power BI content into their my workspace, as soon as they leave the company, no one has access to that. Even the administrator, the tenant administrator of the company couldn't access that. Now you can do that as a Power BI tenant administrator. You can go and say, I want access to this guy's or this uh, girl's um, my workspace, uh, I can get the content and then delete that workspace. Another thing is that I can, as an administrator, uh, choose a dedicated capacity and put all of those my workspaces under that dedicated capacity so I have them all in one location. So it brings some kind of governance. That is one of the good things about this. Um, one other thing that been announced actually today is um, a way that you can, it's not actually like a feature, it's more like a uh, way of implementing it. You can actually build a Power BI solution that is multi-culture solution. It has multiple languages. There is going to be an online session about it, not in our user group, in Microsoft Online um, Forum uh, by Ted Pattison. He's a uh, Microsoft CAT team member. He's going to explain how he can do that. He's actually combining some of the DAX measures such as use culture function combined with um, field parameter. If you have seen that, then this combination work out really nice and you can actually have a report that you can choose different languages like show me in uh, English. Everything is in English change to Spanish. Everything is in Spanish. So it's really cool. Uh, I encourage you to have a look at that. The last thing I wanted to talk about is that you can embed Power BI app inside Teams now. Previously, we could embed uh, a report, a dashboard, something like that inside the Teams, but not the whole app. Embedding a whole app will make it much easier. People in Teams, they don't have to leave the Teams to go and open Power BI. Everything would be in there. Uh, these are all in Microsoft Power BI blog, and make sure to go and check it out. Uh, so that's pretty much me. I'll hand it over to Daryl to start the session. After the session, we'll have the uh, pizza um, drink, whatever it is. Uh, for those online, please make sure that your microphone is muted. If you have any questions, type it in the chat window. I'll uh, pass it on to Daryl. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just 
start by echoing uh, Reza's thanks to the 5 user group, Microsoft, and obviously everyone else that's <clears throat> helped make this uh, possible today. So, my Emmy speech. So, my journey with metadata and lineage, um, and it really has been a, an adventure. Um, I think a rabbit hole uh, would probably be a good example as well. Started with this word here. Um, as soon as I knew what I was doing with uh, T SQL, I realized that this word is actually a real problem and very, very powerful in SQL. Uh, for those of you perhaps not fluent with SQL, you use this word alias something. So you would typically do something like this. You would say, you know, select some column from a, a table. And then you would say, well, I don't want to uh, I don't want to show it like that to my users. I know that it actually means first name and developer discretion. You will just do that almost without thinking. But actually what you've done is you've applied a business rule. You said that if name actually means first name. And this is a trivial example, but you could imagine more complex names of columns could really become quite a problem. For example, in a calculation, you know, uh, total sales or you know, value of uh, sales over a region. And, and, and gradually these terms really carry a lot of weight and we very, very easily just as them. Um, I'm trying to stop that from happening. Let's see why that's happening. So it then gets even more complex because we say, well, we'll choose this if name from this table, this table, um, and now we have uh, another relationship because that CF name is not just F name, but it actually is the one that comes from this table. So suddenly you've got a lot going on. So first name is an alias. We've identified this C is an alias. There's a dependency of this F name to this table, uh, and potentially there's some sort of transformation going on there that um, you know we've done as developers because it makes sense, but is it necessarily the right thing to do? And as developers, we get uncomfortable with that and we do this. We say, oh, OK, well, let's take that and let's simplify it and let's put it into a view, right? Because the view is going to be much easier uh, for everybody to use. And suddenly we're in a situation like this where we're just selecting a column from a view <laughs> and we're in the situation, well, <laughs> where did all the metadata go? And it's because of that that we have to start thinking about the way we write lines of, of data code um, in terms of relationships and um, the interaction between things. So just in this small example, we can say things like first name is an alias for F name or F name is an, uh, has an alias. Uh, F name belongs to cus table. So belongs to becomes a relationship. Um, um, DBO is a SQL schema, so it has a certain type. Uh, you customer depends on customer table. And this is this, this is the most trivial example you can imagine. We've just selected one column from one table. And so this is what uh, drove me to try and really better understand um, metadata and data lineage. And this is really what we're going to talk about for, for most of today. Before I go on. Uh, just a little bit about insight um which is traditionally not a sales pitch environment but I, I think it's important that you know that we're probably the fortune 500 company you haven't heard of uh, we're in 19 countries we have over 12 and a half thousand uh, teammates uh, we've been in new zealand believe it or not for more than 10 years um, and the during that time that was mainly a microsoft lsp uh, now, between New Zealand and Australia, we have um, more than 200 technical resources and focusing heavily on developing uh, our data offering. Um, and I think for me, um, having been around the block more than once, I can uh, honestly uh, attest to the fact that it's a great place to work. Okay, so. Considering the number of people that, that registered, I, I felt that we may just want to get everybody onto the same page of what is it that we're actually talking about today? What is this beast at the level that you would encounter if you were installing it for the first time or out of the box? 
So Purview, it's also had its name changes. It used to be called Azure Purview and now called Microsoft Purview. Um, the strategy, uh, as I understand it from Microsoft, is this tool will be the overarching data governance tool um, and it will be the platform that will have additional services. But as it stands today, when you um, install Purview, you get these components. The first is a, a scanning engine. The scanning engine uh, essentially goes and looks to technical metadata, as we see in the columns, the tables, um, the relationships between schemas, and, um, and, and some it's still in preview, some lineage scanning, the likes of uh, SQL, and, and certainly there's some in Power BI, which we'll, we'll show you. There's also a business glossary. So there's a business glossary that stores your business terms that you wouldn't inherently find in the data. It's search, so obviously that's for your uh, consumers to be able to go and find things in your data estate. Um, there's a service which is recently um, released, which is share. So you can actually share data um, and you will govern the expiration of data being shared. There's a workflow, which is also in preview, which is um, again leaning towards that total data governance practice. And then lineage, which will uh, will go in depth um, today, uh, the metadata management. But just quickly, the kind of screens you would see if you were scanning, you have the ability to register um, a source, and you can see that they haven't held themselves back to Microsoft. Sources. You can scan AWS, um, Hive, Azure Blob Storage, etc. Once you choose uh, once you've registered a source and you want to scan it there's these what they call scan rule sets that are built in so as i showed you in the in this uh, sample demonstration we know that a column belongs to a table belongs to a schema belongs to a catalog that structural um, uh, understanding of the data that we're scanning is basically uh, held in these scan rule sets these are all closed you can't edit them but you can obviously create your own custom ones in addition to scan rule sets, we've got classifications. Now, classifications go one level deeper, and they'll look at uh, content in a table, for example, and look for patterns. So, credit card number, or date of birth, or um, I think there's a bunch here. So, Australian tax file number. So, it knows to find these patterns in the data, and then it will classify those fields accordingly. Lineage extraction, as I said, uh, it's built in for Power BI at the moment. Uh, Azure SQL is in preview, um, and what that does is it attempts to understand the relationships and the flows of, for instance, tables into stored procedures into output. Um, uh, it can already do quite a lot of what I'm about to show you today, but when you really want to get into, into advanced column mapping or uh, advanced processes, then obviously we'll use the API, which, which I'll show in a short while. Glossary, again, as I mentioned, business terms. Um, and once you've got business terms, uh, you can associate them to assets, as you see in that first yellow highlighted area. So you can say this table um, is an example of this particular uh, term. The other thing that it allows is you to enrich in content as well there for resources so there i've just shown a simple example of connecting it to um, earnings before interest tax and amortization to vistopedia so what that allows is for your your business users to have a very rich experience when they when they're looking at content not just a purely technical and search so search is uh, what you would expect it's a search bar but once you delve into the content you have the ability to filter by, you know, certain types like databases, folders, reports, and, and I'll show you this in the, in the interface in, in a short while. Uh, Share, as I said, is um, relatively new. Uh, currently, we, we support Blob Storage uh, and Gen 2 sharing. That means that you can create a share link. Hey, come on. You can create a share link to uh, a file or an asset that's in your data lake. Um, at the moment, it's only in place. In other words, it doesn't leave your environment. It just creates a secure link to, to that asset. And you can share it with anyone who has a registered Azure um, email address. In other words, they must authenticate through some active directory. Um, 
and or uh, an Azure registered app. Um, what's coming in the future, as I understand, is uh, not only in place, but you'll be able to share between um, purview instances. So you'll be able to have data replicated across and when the expiry date's finished, as your, the purview will just take that data away. But those are the, the things that are coming. And then this is also just recently in preview uh, workflow. And as I said, this is leaning toward a data governance um, ecosystem. I hate the terms, but that's kind of where it's going. So here, you, uh, if you've ever worked with Power, uh, what's it called, Power Flow or Power Apps, you've seen an, in, an interface something like this. So in this case, it says when a term is created, it gets submitted for approval. So there'll be some sort of hierarchy of people that need to intervene. And if it gets approval, then the glossary term gets created, emails get sent, and um, the content under here includes other services like being able to run an HTTP um, service, so you can run off to some sort of API and do all sorts of validations. Um, yeah, so that's looking that's looking quite promising as well. So that's really what comes out the box um, when you install and, and fairly easy to get up to speed. Um, but let's go and have a look at, at some lineage. So what I've done is I've installed Purview. I've got a, an Azure data lake with some, uh, just a, a bundle of files, one or two, I think. Um, and I've got uh, Synapse and Power BI and very little content in all of that. It's really just to show you the, the proof of, of concept. So in your Azure portal, you find um, your view account there, and you would just simply click. Wait, another window will open up here, and you've got this governance portal, and that takes you to the interface here. As I was showing you earlier, this allows you to do searching. So uh, if we look for something like sample data, um, so it'll bring back the assets and you'll see that this is showing me that this is a Power BI report. This is a data set. There's another Power BI data uh, report. I can do the standard sort of filtering on this. Uh, and when you search, it'll do a free text search on all attributes that are um, recorded against the entity. So you can have asset description, classifications, properties, lineage we'll get to in a moment, contacts. So it tells you who the expert is in this. So if you were a new BA or a business analyst coming into an environment and you were looking at a report and you wanted to question somebody and say, well, you know, who, who knows about this? Um, you wouldn't have to the typical grapevine, you could say, well, there's the user right there. So these are the, the, the kind of reasons that you would want to do that. Let's have a look at, at lineage very simply. So this is a Power BI lineage, and it looks very um, elementary. But essentially what we have is in our Power BI environment, we have this data set, and this data set produces this uh, BI report that we have here. So if I went and switched to the sample data, I could see that oh, this also is involved in this report. And so now I can move through and navigate and switch to the asset. In the Power BI lineage environment, it does allow me to go immediately into, uh, into Power BI. So if I said, uh, show me this asset and open in Power BI, it will obviously immediately link across to that report. And should load internet willing. But this makes, uh, again, at this, this is a very broad, high level brush stroke. This allows you to really, um, in terms uh, used loosely, democratize your data because somebody can look at this, they can find out who the expert is, they can see what caused this. Uh, so, so lineage is what we're going to talk about today, and it's the relationship between these these types of things, um, and we'll show how we can get really deep into that. Just a quick uh, view of the the structure. So um, 
when you register sources, you create these collections and these allow you to scan. Remember I said one of the engines that you get is a scanning engine and this does technical metadata out the box. Um, when we want to create something more around relationships, this is typically when we'll use the API. I'll also show you um, how we can do that manually. Um, just those other screens, this is to share data. Um, there's data policies and then there's the ability to, to manage connections to other things like a data factory, for example, um, and you can, you can scan those too. Okay, so let's go back into a lineage and I'll just show you, um, sorry, just let's get back in there. Let's go back to this Power BI one. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to take you to a, a SQL one rather. Um, so let's go to sample tweets. So this is um, this is a, a let's see. Let's use tweet. Should we get that. There we go. So what's important to, to see here is, first of all, is the name of the entity, sample tweets. But what you see under here is your Synapse dedicated SQL table is something called a type. I just want you to hang that up in your, in your mind because we're going to come back and talk quite a lot about that. But what's important to see here, as I said, when you're doing a technical metadata scan, those scan set rules understand the hierarchy and the structure of the data. So if you see here, sample tweets, um, that's the name of the table. We know that it has to belong to a schema. Those are the rules, right, for a T-SQL database. So it belongs to DBO, which is the schema name. We know that that has to live in a database, the rules. You can't have it without. And we know that in because this is Synapse, it lives in a Synapse workspace. Um, to have a slide on this, so I might be double explaining. But what you see here is uh, the type name. So this is Azure sample tweets, but it's an Azure Synapse dedicated SQL table. That's its type. There are many of those in the world of our data. Um, Azure Synapse dedicated SQL schema, that's the type. There's probably fewer of those. So you might have, you know, DBO, you might have landing, staging, curated, etc. Um, SQL database, there'll be fewer of those still, but this is the type um, that, that we're talking about. So I'm going to flip back to the slides. Unfortunately, we have to just do a little bit of, um, of explanations before we can actually um, get to the code. So just bear with me a little bit longer and we'll get into the meaty stuff. So that type su system feels a little bit, I only analogy I could find was like Inception, the movie, where you kind of have to create the thing that defines the thing. Um, and the type system is that. So let's come back to the example that I showed earlier. It said first name is an alias for if name. OK, let's start with if name belongs to cus table and let's just see what's actually going on under the hood. So if name we know is a SQL column. That's the type. We know that this particular entity, the particular instance of that type is called F name. We know that it's an Azure SQL column and we know that this is an entity. In that way, we also have the relationship type. So F name belongs to cus table, also a type, and there's now a relationship between these two types. Relationship itself is also a type. When we come back to this screen, um, you'll see here that those are structurally typed. But what's also um, important to see at this point is this fully qualified name. Now, this is what actually holds the anchor for every single entity. This name, oh, sorry, this name has to be unique throughout the whole system. So every column will have its own absolutely unique name every table, every database, uh, and so on. And this is the reference that we start to use when creating relationships between. 
So, again, be technical. Is this data model that exists? And it has, uh, for instance, columns, databases, views. They all live in a type that's called a data set. The other um, most important type is a process. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, the asset, um, the data set inherits from assets. So the data set typically will have a name and a description. That's what I sh I'll show you now. There's just the sort of minimum attributes that we need. And then referenceable, that, uh, that is that unique identifier. So there's, there's this unique key. But the question obviously is, well, where does, what is this thing? Where does this actually live? Um, and so now just one more step down the rabbit hole. When you install Purview, what you're really installing under the hood um, is this architecture. So the core system is built on, uh, the storage is uh, HBase and, and Solar. The core engine is a Janus buff database. So if, if you're unfamiliar with graph databases, um, a graph database uh, essentially makes the relationship between entities first class citizens. So, very elaborate. Uh, if you create a table today, let's say customer and address, you know that the relationship between there's a, a foreign key, uh, private key relationship. But in, in SQL, or T-SQL at, at least, or MS SQL, um, we don't describe the relationship. It's really just a constraint. An attempt to do this is uh, another way to, to do a graph database is to use a modeling technique called Data Vault. Some of you may be familiar with Data Vault modeling. A Data Vault modeling creates a notion of a link, and the link makes the relationship between entities first class citizens. Um, the difference is that the, the graph is uh, essentially a SQL database, it's, it's all JSON. Um, um, and as such is very efficient, very fast and very, very flexible and, and you can expand these things. The graph engine and the language that they typically use to query and, and work with that is called Gremlin. Uh, another, another competitor in the marketplace is Neo4j, which I'm quite fond of, and their query language is Cypher. But in the core, we have this type system, which we just looked at. Um, and the um, API we're, we're about to look at now. The graph engine is responsible for storing. The type system is responsible for categorizing and cataloging the data. And the API is what we're going to have a look at now, which is which is how we access that. Before I go on, are there any pressing questions? Everyone following? It's clear enough? Yeah. Okay. Happy to answer questions at all. Anyone Question. online? Yes. Why do you think your original search failed for the um, tweet table? Uh, it like case sensitive or I'm not sure. I have to I have to go back and have a look. Yeah, yeah, it was case, case sensitive. sensitive. Yeah, I was surprised. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was surprised because it was already queued in my search. So I'd done it before. Yeah, okay, we can go and have a look at that. Um, there is a question online as well. Yes. The glossary that you mentioned in your slides before. Yes. Uh, can that be available through URL so that we can link to it from Power BI? So I'm going to say yes, because you just need to be able to access the, the API. But I don't think I don't think you can just query it without being authenticated. So okay. in your HTTP call, you're going to have to make sure you pass through some sort of credentials. Purview is like super retentive on security, as it should be. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. OK, cool. Um, how do we access the API? So essentially, is uh, the REST API, which I'll take you and show you what the what the structure of that looks like and, and why you get uh, how you get content back. Python um, SDK is the one I'm going to be using and showing today. Um, Purview CLI, there's an open source project I think for that. PowerShell AZ uh, AZ Purview is really limited to admin tasks as far as I can see, and the uh, .NET SDK is, is ramping up pretty rapidly if you wanted to write .NET. Um, but in principle, the whole API is REST based, so you could pretty much use anything you wanted. Um, I'm also right now, before we get into it, I just really want to make a shout out to this guy. He's uh, very generous on the web. Paul Johnson, 
I think he's actually built the Pi Apache Atlas API. Um, his videos are outstanding. He's got examples of bulk uploads into Excel. So um, feel free to, to uh, go have a look at his stuff. OK, so let's um, let's just go back here for a second. What we're going to do now is I'm going to show you how you can read and access the, the API using uh, using REST, and I'll just use Postman for that. Um, and then I'm going to take you into Python SDK and we'll show some of the, the things we can do there. The principle, though, that, that I want you to take away regardless is this, this um, uh, type-based thinking, um, how you create a type and then instantiate a type and then you can work with it. So, so that's really what, what we want to look at today. So let's start with, the, with Postman. So uh, all the standard things you would do, and this will be deleted after the presentation, so feel free to go if you want. Um, so you would, uh, as you do with any application, you register the application in Azure. Uh, you take your client ID, client secret, you create a, a client secret, um, and the resource that you're chasing for this particular one is purview.azure.net. Uh, then up the sleeves, uh, just get a get a token. And what we'll do is we will use this token. Uh, there's a better way to do this, but I'm just doing it manually today. Call me button above it. No, no, I mean, there's a better way just to push the token into the variable. So what we're going to do here is we're going to run this against the API. Is there a way I can make the screen bigger? Can everyone see all right? We just key plus. Key plus. Oh, ooh. and then we just key minus. Key minus. The mouse will follow the window where we oh, Okay, so there we go. That's what I wanted to show. So where we're going is the MS Purview DJW. That's my um, installation and my implementation of, of Purview. Um, the Catalog API Atlas version 2 is, is the API link types, type defs. So we are going to ask um, Purview to please give us all um, the type definitions that it has um, already in the system. So I'm going to kill that for a moment. Let's run that. What comes back for us now is um, all sorts of things that uh, we would make use of in a type system. So what I'm going to do is just go straight down to a, uh, a zero equal a table. So what we have here, you can see in the list, um, the supertype is asset, and the subtypes are Azure SQL table. Um, you'll see there's all sorts of things like Erwin entities, Oracle table, Azure table, uh, and these are all the entities that have already been provisioned um, for us to be able to scan and and work with in um, the. If I wanted to get a specific entity, again, just proof of concept. So let's say we wanted to see this sample tweets. We'll just steal the, the good from here. And I can use that in the. Um, oh, that's going to give me a problem. I have to copy that across. Using a trackpad, I'm hating it. Ah, jump. Try oh, the copy button. In the middle. You just copy. Can you just copy that? I copy everything. Yeah. 
We were lucky. They copied the whole thing. Give me a second. I will get it. This this time. There we go. Yay. Being params, you're an authorization. Authorization fourth to oh, this is annoying. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. What we'll do is we'll take this query over there. Everyone. <clears throat> so here what I've done is I've selected that particular entity. So this is how you can interact with the, the REST API by passing through a GUID. If you knew it or you would have some kind of in, uh, application that would return the, the GUIDs for you. And here you can see it. Uh, this is in, remember I said that type, it has a type name. So this is Azure Synapse dedicated SQL uh, column. And as you go through this whole JSON payload here, will give you all of the attributes that you can set um, against this item and remember that any um, any uh, entity can be extended so you can say I also want this attribute and I want to store this uh, one of the use cases we were looking today is if we could take metadata out of word documents and include that in the scan uh, and so we could definitely do that we just ex we extend it uh, okay, so that was just to show you this is how you can do it in postman but let's go to your show. I'll just uh, set the scene here as well. So this is Python. Um, and what's important to, to see here in this code is that you use the Azure purview libraries. Um, there's a scanning library, there's a catalog library, as an administration library. Um, so if you wanted to do things um, related to scanning, you would then go and use the purview scanning client. And there's certain methods that are embedded in that client. Um, the same applies to the catalog client and so on. Um, the guy who I mentioned earlier, who's built the Pi Apache um, client, has um, a consolidated library, which is the purview client. So this will make your life much easier, especially if you're following through the examples. If you, you know, if you had authenticated using the Azure client and you were trying to run something from the Purview client, it gets a little bit frustrating. <laughs> um, so it, it's very simple. Um, in Python, you just go off and get the credentials, um, and then you instantiate your client. Um, where am I? Here we go. This is using that Purview client. You use your instance. In my case, it's MS Purview DJW, and you pass the credentials in, and it returns a client for you. Just as we did earlier, um, this code is going to uh, go and get that uh, catalog client from using Microsoft, and it will show us all the the type depths. But it'll just sh show a, um, a very brief summary, showing you now how how this works in Python. Um, and so it produces a result. So these Python libraries will talk through to the API. So I just wanted to be sure there was nothing um, that was perhaps not, uh, not easily known. So if you remember the diagram um, that showed the base types, we had um, we had process and we had entity. Now entities are the uh, structured fixed. Uh, we know their the absolute lineage, but processes are things that require inputs and outputs. So what I'm showing you here, uh, you will see in the the uh, current purview that does lineage um, or SQL Server, you will see something equivalent to that. 
Um, and basically, this it reads the stored procedure metadata and says the stored procedure is at its top level dependent on these attributes in these tables and columns. And if it if it produces an output, um, you know, it would will write to this table or it will produce a, a view that has these attributes. We're doing the exact same thing here. We're just using um, we're just using some simple examples. And so here I'm saying that um, I'm going to change this. I'm going to say I have um, entity which is called uh, my UBI demo data. Um, and this type is a data set. Remember I said you columns, tables, DBO, etc. Those are all in the data set type. Um, I give it a fully qualified name. If you're doing a data, data governance project, you're going to want to spend some time thinking about this when you are creating entities that don't already have a fixed hierarchy. So remember, the qualified name for a for a column will be what it's inherited. It's you know its parents right up to the the workspace name. And when you are creating processes, they may not be embedded in anything physical. So it could just be a um, you know some stored procedure or a ETL process, or it could be an API that you're calling out to. So the qualified name is definitely something you'd want to give attention to, bearing in mind that it should reveal to, to anyone looking at it where I could find this thing. Um, so for now, we'll just go my PBI input. Yes. Can you zoom in a little bit? Oh, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. How's that? Yeah. Get it? I'll call this my PBI input. Um, and this one will say uh, my PBI reference data, call it really matter. And, um, just to explain the, the way the, the API works, this GUID that I'm giving it is, is not a GUID, as you can see, it's just a negative number, and that's fine. As it imports, it just allocates that number temporarily and will go off and generate a GUID for that. So I'm going to call this my uh, PBI curated output. Output. I'm going to create a process and we're going to call it my PBI process. Um, but, uh, and, uh, what's your name? Tim. I'm going to put Tim in there. So I'll call it Tim's awesome process. That you know, I haven't, I haven't preloaded it. <laughs> um, so what this does is this says I'm going to create a new type. See that? You can create a type. It's a process, and a process uh, also needs a qualified name. But I'm allowed to give it an input, and I'm allowed to tell it what its output's going to be. Now this is trivial in our world at the moment. It's trivial, but. As you have more and more processes, you can describe them and you know identify who's the expert in this particular area. Um, and so it would be it makes sense then to to do this. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a, a purview client, and we are going to upload these entities. So we're going to upload output zero one, which we've seen up there. Uh, um, input zero one, input zero two and the process itself. So this is taking all of those, um, those configurations that we've created, and it's going to push it up to our purview instance. How does it know where to push it? Well, it gets that from the client. OK, so let's do the run thing and hope it works. OK, so I'm going to just get rid of that for a second. 
let's head over to purview now and see if we had any impact on the database. Um, look for, um, what did we just create? Anything PBI, right? PBI. So the, here we go. Here's my PBI curated output as an example. So <clears throat> we're not going to have a look at the lineage. Now I can see these were the tables I'm into this process. This is the output. Now, remember, each one of these is an entity and can be labeled with a contact, with glossary terms, with other data that enriches an understanding of each one of these. And it does show you now the, the, um, the, the flow of data from one side to another. So I can control that whole API using code but i also have the ability to do this in the interface i can say oh this my pvi demo data actually it has an upstream dependency i can go here and i can say well i want to add this uh, lineage manually i can say this thing is actually uh, dependent on uh, let's say sample tweets now i can create um, on the fly, I can say, oh, you know, if I'm the curator, I can say, oh, these things now um, live together or have some kind of relationship. With each other. So I can do that through the UI at a certain level, and obviously I can do all of that uh, through the API. Now, I'm, I want to show just one more um, um, thinking, so I'll just save this. There are some constraints when trying to map Power BI data sets across to SQL assets, but I, I think it's it's just a temporary thing and we certainly can overcome it. The API, but through the UI, there's some limitations. And I think that's also a, a, a takeaway. Remember that the engine underneath is this the Apache Atlas, which is just this huge grunty engine. Um, and Microsoft are being new, more and more features to the UI. So more and more of that's going to become you know, really available. So the one thing I know, uh, certainly some people that are online uh, who I, I work with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, will want to know about, well, what about column mapping? And um, just show the example. And we'll just talk about how we wind this up. So is an entity type that you create this process remember we spoke about types so there's a type of process and i've called it my custom column mapping process it has a unique uh, keyword against it it's an attribute which is called column mapping what this allows me to do is when i create this entity i can go and i can see i can take the columns that i have i structure it like this Structure it something like this. Oh, sorry. Um, with the things. But what you have here is uh, we create um, essentially a, a data array called Col Map. And <clears throat> what we do is we'll take the source and the sync. Say customer ID maps to customer ID in these two table names from IN01 to AE out by name, um, and that's the data set mapping. And this allows us to map not only entities like tables and, and uh, views to procedures, but we can actually start to really map right down um, at the column, uh, the column level. Um, the UI at the moment is a little bit variable on how that displays, but I, I have it on good authority that that's, that's be soon to be resolved and you'll be able to track the columns and and relate the columns right down to process level so the question obviously that's uh, outstanding is to say well that's a lot of code to write um, if you just wanted to map some addresses and the the truth is that we um, certainly insight has the the capability to write these passing uh, tools and we have some for sql for example and 
I certainly worked on others, that gets the metadata out from these systems and puts them into a format like that, um, just for that initial load. Another, one of the messages, and I'll, I'll go to my closing slide, is that data governance and this kind of management is not, the tool is not your biggest concern. So this is a very powerful tool and will probably meet 90, 95% of your requirements. Data management, data governance, metadata management, data lineage, it really is a cultural thing. Because you have to assign you know, data curators and explain to them what their responsibilities are. Um, so we have an internal um, strategy team that's working on building out those kinds of templates and, and helping customers to really understand data governance more than just how to use the tool. But obviously, you know, also, you've seen today, we, we know what we're doing there. So I'm just watching the time, so I'm going to close it off there just with my final slide. And that's uh, again, um, I'll send this, I'll, I'll post this information to Layla and she can she can share it. Uh, one of the examples, as I said, is uh, on this guy's website, he does have ex uh, Excel templates. So if you wanted to you know, update curator for all certain entities, um, it shows you how to do that. And, he, and he's, a, he's a tremendous guy. So, so yeah, this is really the key takeaways, um, even though it, it might have been a little bit complex toward the end. So first of all, Purview is a, is a graph database, and that's critical that, to, to really understand because it makes it so powerful and so flexible. It uses a type system. As you've seen, there's asset types, there's data set types, process types, and these entities have type-based relationships. So it's pretty much types all the way down. And because of that, any pattern can be supported. So you can create your own types, your own relationship types, your own entity types beyond what's already available in Purview. It is moving very fast. Even while preparing for this presentation in the, you know, in the three weeks that I've been working on it, suddenly you'll see uh, this, this new <laughs> functions in preview. Um, and so they really are investing a tremendous amount. Uh, but at the moment, anything that's missing and being able to active, actively edit and add in the UI is available through the API. Um, the same would apply for if you needed some so specific kind of um, consumer interface that you wanted to work on, you, you could write an interface over the, over the API. And so I think now questions and then I assume food. Not for those that are online. Are there any questions online? Uh, nothing yet. I have a question though. Yes, please. Like, um, so this is great that the API gives us uh, ability to like pass on some of the details so that we create our like, metadata model over there. But does Purview itself has a tool um, to, let's say, connect to Power BI, get all the lineage and information and then push it in purview. Yes. Oh, sorry. I, I, I thought that was obvious, but let me let me go back there. Um, sorry, Reza. Thank That's you for right. asking the question. So what you've seen here is um, I create my collection. You'll see that one of my sources that I've created is actually a Power BI um, connection. So if you have a look at these details, um, we'll see it actually goes, uh, sorry. Uh, it's, my scans, it shows this one. See this particular scan. Um, to just re-register. Um, I'm trying to find the details. So, yeah, so that's my Power BI tenant ID. It's up there on the screen. Right. If I go to Power BI um, itself, I go over to my, I need to go to admin. Actually, let me show you a scan. Um, so if we go to set up. Uh, actually, this is going to delay it. This, this is 
pain. But let me show you. I'll just open up uh, this sample report. And let me create a new report. I'll just go to uh, my workspace. It was good to hear from that. So I can just say sample data set. And I, what I'll do is I'll create a report, do an auto create from my data set. I'm going to save this and I'm going to call it uh, Res's report. And I'll head over back over to Purview. Um, I'm still stuck in the thing here. Uh, go away. I logged in as a other account. Sorry, just bear with me. I'll just uh, and again. Things. Oh, go and jump in the bay, man. Going too well, you see. <laughs> Everyone's working. Oh, uh, at least. The bars had been no, no one's <laughs> going to be able to get anything from you, man. <laughs> Even if you cut my thumb off, it's still not enough. <laughs> uh, more. <laughs> Fingerprints. Yeah, yeah I'm the same. <laughs> Fingerprint. Yeah. You also need a fingerprint to get into authenticator so you can authenticate it with the fingerprint. That's right, yeah, yeah. But it works. <laughs> okay, yay, we're back. <laughs> okay, so here we are. So I'm just going to go um, and view the details and I'm going to go to the scan. So this is a scan that was already set up because remember we've got scan rules as well as various other things we can apply at scan time. It's annoying me now. Okay. And this one. And I'm going to run the scan now. Good now. I will hit you. Scan. Really? Okay. Okay. The scan's running. Yay! It does work. So it'll take a little while. So what it does now is it runs off to my Power BI client, my my workspace, that or that tenant ID, and it knows how to understand and read Power BI. It's in that technical scan set, and it'll read through Power BI and read everything and writes it across into the purview graph database in that type um, configuration. So it'll write Power BI uh, data set, report, um, whatever, else it, whatever else it finds there. Yeah. Um, and that just takes a little while. And when it's ready, it'll refresh and it'll be available in purview. 
but we just give it that time. Come on, going on. Thank you, Cheers, Pascal. OK, so let's head over here back to the search and see. What did we call it? Razor's report, right? Razor. I think yet in the. In the While we wait for it, let's see. What did we say? Sample. Tweet. Tweets. Uh, this one didn't return any results, did it? But, it's a, but suggestions is also. Yeah. Oh, I see. Capital. So let's just see. Yeah, that returns nothing. So it is case sensitive. It has to be case sensitive. Which is, in this day and age, it's unusual. I, I, I'm not convinced of that. On the space? It depends on how the tables are, are allowed or not. Yeah, because I think it is quite strange. Sample data. See, that returns. That's not case sensitive. That's the space. Oh, bigger button. There's a space in sample tweets. space? Yeah. Ah, you're kidding. There's a space between them, that's why. Yeah. If you type sample space tweet, it'll work. Regardless of case. I'm just waiting for that other. Oh, there is no space. Interesting. Learn something every day. Uh, no, I think there's something wrong with that. But anyway, we'll, we'll go and fix that. OK, so we're looking for anything Reza. So let's see if that scan is finished. Is, uh, it. Let's see if the scan is finished. In progress. The scans do take a lot of time because it's got to get that data, it's got to strip it out, it's got to work it out, put it into the right places, data database. And it says no. Come, come. Well, that is coming. Another question. How is the licensing of purview? Is it per objects in your model, per number of API calls? Do you have any? I'm not the, <laughs> I'm not the right person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, no. um, uh, my understanding is it's, it's a, it's a per seat. Right. OK, um, but but don't quote me. I'm, I'm not. Right. No, that's all good. The guy that writes a code, man. <laughs> Else pays for it. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, from what I've read in the in the reviews and people that are using it, most people find they get a return on investment in their first month. I know that sounds like sales pitch, but they're saying just the ability to search for where a table is or where a stored procedure is and what impacts a, a certain output is already just that visibility. Um, you know, is is giving them value because it saves them so much time. Um, that's not a business case, but uh, well, it still helps developers, right? Oh man, you just can't believe it. Um, because you can hop in and you can you can suddenly see uh, one of the use cases that I've experienced is to see if something's already been done. Yes. <laughs> so you don't want to do it again, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see, like, because like some queries will be so close. Yeah. And you think, oh. You might even have a stored procedure made of that query, and you might just exactly, type it again. Exactly. Cool. And 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 as uh, and and what you just said now is so important because as you work with it, you'll enrich it. You'll go, ah, oh, the person that helped me with this stored procedure was, you know, time. Uh, Jane down in accounts. She she knew exactly what was meant in here. So you'll put that in. And you might not ever look at that again, but somebody else is going to come along and, and see it. So uh, I, I don't want to sound too salesy, but <laughs> do you use it? What's that? Do you personally use it? Well, we're we're a consulting firm, so I I don't I don't manage my own internal data inside. So I'm not sure if somebody 
in the group does. It's quite possible. We do a lot of purview work over in Australia. Yes. Uh, the guys are actually writing adapters to help customers ingest uh, complex metadata. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're just seeing value almost straight off, straight off the bat. Licensing? Yes. Data map, 41 cents per capacity unit per hour, 73 hours for up to 10 gig. Scanning, pay as you go. Minimum duration of all scans a month, 60 per hour. B2B corporate scan, $63. Resource set, um, our duration processing advanced resources, 21 cents per V Corp per hour. It's um, not just too bad. Well, just one thing to know is you can't pause per view. Uh, like you can pause yeah. your um, you get a SQL pool. You can't pause it, you, you can delete it. And say, please don't bill me for a day or two. Quite the beast thing. <laughs> oh, come on. Why is it taking so long? It's taking so long. How big is the query? I'm going to have a quick look. Maybe it's in already. Anything, <laughs> Reza? Reza's got too much data. There we go. Yes, Reza's report. <laughs> there you go. There's your report. <laughs> and we can immediately see the lineage. So we know that that report's dependent on this data set. Right. Yeah. So what we can do now, as I said, uh, you can go and say, well, you know, the expert for this is Reza. Um, these are the related reports. Um, it also shows where it's located, so in the workspace. Um, so that would help people that were challenged with, with those problems. As I said, the lineage, the properties. Um, and, and again, you can have any number of classifications, uh, managed attributes. There's, there's a number of things that you can span each, each entity. Uh, and, that, and again, that, that's really the, the key message there is that it's not a, it, it, the tool doesn't solve the problem right. It's a it's a really good tool, probably up there with the best. Um, but if you don't have a culture of data governance, managing it, it's going to stay uh, uh, with all respect because we would benefit from it. It's going to stay with developers, and and while that's great, it's not really where you're going to get the most value. And uh, as I said, um, the way I understand it, Microsoft is using this. Will continue to use this as data governance. So already the, the maps that we have there against attributes and security already come from the, the 365 world, um, from the CRM environment. So it, I think they're just going to continue to do this right to the point of being able to control the access you know, at a table level. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you can answer it. Thank you.